Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will cover community ecology. And I'm going to use PowerPoint to help me with this topic. So that's the PowerPoint that I will use. Let's go ahead and begin. So populations of one species never live in isolation from other population of other species. That does make sense, right? So the interacting populations occurring in a given habitat form a ecological community. So when population live in the same area, they interact with each other. And this is what represents this community of different populations. And um, ecological community is studied by community ecology. So scientists study ecology at the community level to understand how species interact with each other and complete, compete for the same resources. So when we're looking about interspecific interactions, uh, we can classify them according to the effect on a population. And we can use minus and plus signs to represent those interactions. So we might have minus minus interactions. And this is a curve when two populations in a community compete for a common resource. So it's kind of like uh, both populations are in disadvantage. All right. So they compete for the same resource, so they both are harmed. Um, make sure that you understand that that's actually very good for evolution, the competition, but for individual population, it might not be that great. Um, interactions can be plus plus, and then they are mutually beneficial. Uh, example would be uh, interaction between plants and their pollinators. Uh, we can use plus and minus. And this interaction occur when one population benefits and the other population is harmed, such as in predation. Uh, predator benefits and prey is harmed. Or it can be plus zero interactions and they occur when one population benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. So each um, population occupy its own ecological niche. Niche is not the same as a habitat. Niche actually is the role a species plays in its community, including its habitat, and it's including all the interaction with other organisms. And um, competitive Exclusion principle states that if two species have an ecological niche that is too similar, the two species cannot co coexist in the same place and at the same time, right? So if you look over here at this graph, and this graph gives us the population density of two microscopic protists, um, and that's paramecium, paramecium aurelia and paramecial codatum. Um, and this is done in a, a laboratory, but they cultivate these two little living organisms uh, and they have very, very similar niches. So when they cultivate them in a separate culture, um, separate culture means, well, you have like, let's say, like a Petri dish or some other container where these organisms are growing, maybe like a little, um, um, I don't know, uh, like a little aquarium or something, right? And you can see that if they uh, live separately, the population density increases for both of them, right? But if you put these two little organisms in the same culture, in the same little aquarium, then, um, you see how they start competing for resources and one species survive and increase in uh, population increases in size and the other population is decreasing 
and might even get completely um, extinct from this particular environment. So that's what comparative exclusion principle states. Now, habitat is a part of a niche, and habitat, this is really simple. This is where species live and reproduce. And uh, when we have a uh, competition minus minus, and if species live in the same habitat, then this competition can lead to resource partitioning. And resource partitioning um, decreases this competition and leads to increased niche specialization and less niche overlap. Um, so here are the diagrams that explain um, what all this stuff means. So imagine if we have this one, two, three, four, five different species of birds living in the same area, in the same habitat. And then really niches are pretty similar. Um, so they compete for the same source of food and maybe for the same space to raise their youngs, uh, lay their eggs, and so on. So when this happens, we have this partitioning, resource partitioning. When, um, you know, they kind of try to stay and feed in their particular area. So their niche became narrow, right? But that allows them to coexist on the same territory. So that represents, I'll go back, what we call niche or resource partitioning. So those intra-specific uh, competition, minus minus, and intra means um, between, between species, it limits population size and it drives natural selection. It's very strong evolutionary force. Another type of interaction, plus plus, is called mutualism. In mutualism, both species benefit from an interaction. So example would be digestive bacteria and humans. And um, you have lots of your natural flora or what we call good bacteria in our digestive system. And bacteria help you to digest food. So we benefit from this uh, bacteria in our large intestine, uh, right? So we can um, maybe um, you know, digest the food that was not digested. And there is actually even some vitamins that, that we must have this bacteria to absorb those vitamins, like vitamin group B. So we do need this normal flora of the digestive system and how bacteria benefits. Well, bacteria have place to live and food to eat and has ability to reproduce and so on, right? So that's mutualism. Uh, another example of mutualism shown over here, protozoa and termites. Um, or termites, they feed on wood, and wood is a cellulose. Cellulose is actually very hard to digest. And even termites, they need help uh, from little protozoa. Um, and those are proteins, like little microscopic animal-like uh, creatures. They're not animals, they're protists but they animal-like, and they live in the digestive system in the stomach of termites. So here's a termite, here's his stomach, and inside the stomach you have this little, you know, organism that help termites to digest food and, and, have, and they have place to live. Another example of mutualism is sea anemones and clownfish. Um, if you remember this Finding Nemo um, Disney uh, movie, right? So that's clownfish uh, live in this sea anemones and it has safe place to live. And at the same time, they protect sea anemones from their predator, right? That is butterfly. Um, so mutualism uh, usually involves the evolution of related adaptations in both species, and a very good example of mutualism is co-evolution of flowers and pollinators. 
And if we look at the, uh, let's say, color of the flower, order, shape, bloom time, and nectar, and we can, uh, and, we, and we look at their pollinators, you see how they adapted to each other, right? So if a color is dull, white, green, purple, the uh, pollinator are bad. Let's say butterflies over here, they prefer orange and, uh, and uh, red and purple color. Right. So, and the same is order, uh, right? Let's say if it's uh, fertilized by wind, then there is no need to have these nice colors or any order for the flowers right? and so on. And also nectar, uh, is nectar is present or it's absent or the none, right? Like for wind. So that's example of mutualism and it's example of co-evolution when both flowers and pollinator develop the traits that benefit both species. Uh, another interaction is plus minus. An example would be predation. And this is where one species benefit and another species are harmed. And what is harmed are prey. And we see also numerous adaptation for predator and for the prey through the natural selection. Um, so here's one adaptation, cryptic coloration. Cryptic coloration is camouflage. And this is a way for prey to hide from predators. So on this picture, you can see a seahorse that actually right here and the corals. And that's, that's amazing how similar they look like. Look at this coloration in the shape and of the body and everything. Uh, these seahorses were discovered completely by accident. They were captured along with some corals and only were discovered when the coral, uh, corals uh, were being studied, right? So that's example of adaptation of a prey, cryptic coloration. Another adaptation are warning coloration. Uh, usually bright coloration tells predators that prey is dangerous or toxic, right? So usually it's really like a bright stuff. And um, so predators see these bright colors and they know it's better not to uh, waste their time and energy because that can be really bad and even dangerous for the predator. Um, mimicry is another adaptation and mimicry when one species resemble another that possess an avert anti-predator defense, right? So uh, mimicry, there is two types of mimicry, Batesian mimicry and uh, Mullerian mimicry. And uh, Batesian mimicry, when species does not possess the defense of the organism mimicked. And Mullerian mimicry, when both species possess the protective defense, right? So example would be that the wasp, right, that can sting. And you can see Mullerian mimicry over here of a bee that also can sting. So they both have the same protective um, defense mechanism and they do look similar, right? So the predator once trying to uh, kill a wasp, and you know, being um, sting, next time will not mess with wasp or with bee because they look very similar. But here is actually a fly, hoverfly, and hoverfly cannot sting, right? But it's, it look like it can. So that protects all those animals from the predators because one time predator tries, right? Next time predator will avoid all these three different species. Uh, startle response. Startle response is elaborate anatomical structure that frighten the predator. Um, and um, some of them are harmless and others do have some um, quills or, you know, some maybe, um, they do have some mechanism of protection some of these animals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, or prey can resemble a predator. Uh, so here's, let's say, a predator, jumping spider, 
And this is a snowberry fly that's a prey, but it's, uh, if you look at, uh, on the wings, it look like, it does look like this, uh, you know, feet of the spider. So it does resemble spider. Uh, over here, we can see the false um, eyed frog, right? So that's look like a big head. So the animal looking bigger. Um, this is a caterpillar that has some extra eyes, or this is a moth. This also look like, like a big head or some bigger animal, right? So that's all startled, uh, startled response. Um, so what we talk about was prey, but predators, they also have their own adaptation. Let's take vision, for example. So if you look at the uh, carnivore and herbivore, well, carnivores, they usually um, have their eyes forward um, uh, that located um, in the forward location, right? So you're looking straight ahead of you. Um, and a prey usually um, have eyes on a side. So why would we have this forward location? Because forward location of the eyes give you binocular vision and it gives you depth perception. So you can really estimate how far away the prey is. When you, can, uh, you, when you have this ability to judge distances, you can anticipate your every move. Right, so, and sometimes it's a matter of life and death for a predator. Sometimes predators have only one try to jump or um, no, to, to get a prey and get a food and, you know, and survive. So it's very important for a predator to have this binocular vision. However, for the prey, what is important for the, fray, for, for the prey? important is to uh, see the predator in time. So that give you, uh, you know, the um, bigger field of view. Um, next adaptation is smell. Um, also looking at uh, predators and looking at the structure of the snout, uh, we can really see if this predator use a smell for hunting or not that much. So if you compare, um, I think this is a coyote, right? And the, yeah, that's a coyote. And this is a bobcat. Um, so uh, coyotes, they have this long snout and this provides room for complex um, nasal passages. And inside those nasal passages, you have neurons, olfactory neurons that allow you to have a really great um, uh, sense of smell. And um, they hunt, um, they rely on their smell by hu hunting a lot. When you look at bobcat, uh, or you can see that they rely mostly on a vision, not that much on smell, and that's why they have fairly short snout. So that's adaptation for smell. Okay, so another example of plus minus uh, interaction would be herbivory. So herbivory is a consumption of plant part or algae by an animal. And here we also have lots of defense mechanism against herbivory, including spines, thorns, chemical toxins. Even what we use in our, you know, in the cooking, peppermint, cloves, cinnamon, right? this is actually protective chemicals and toxins that are supposed to uh, keep the um, uh, herbivores away from, from these plants. Uh, another plus minus interaction are parasites. Um, so plants and animals can be victims of parasites. Uh, animals that live in or on host from which they obtain nutrients 
and um, it can be the parasites or pathogens. So parasites are animals, pathogens are bacteria, viruses, fungi, proteas, right? So and again, uh, the, um, we have the uh, parasite or pathogen, and then we have a host. Like over here, if you look at the mosquito, mosquito is a parasite, and it gets advantage of the host that, let's say, human, for example, right? Um, brood parasitism shown over here, um, present in some birds when they lay their eggs in other um, birds' um, uh, Oh my oh goodness, what it, <laughs> right? So they, they put their eggs in the nest of other birds, sorry for that. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's also using advantage of other species. Um, plus zero interaction is called commensalism. Commensalism is an interaction between species that benefits one, but neither helps or harms the other. So orchids would be, exa would be example, uh, some orchids grow on trees, but they do not harm the tree. Uh, remora, remora is a small um, uh, fish that attaches itself to a larger animal like a shark, and it's traveled with the shark, and it's actually give it, you know, easy way to travel, and plus they feed on whatever leftovers um, would be available from the shark meal. Um, so here we have a different type of interactions um, between species in the community, minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So that's a summary of what we just covered right now. Let me see how many slides we have. Uh, we, we're almost done with this chapter. Okay. So we'll, uh, we studied the interaction between different populations and species. Now let's look at characteristic of communities. So communities are complex um, systems that can be characterized by the structure, number, and size of population in the interactions and dynamics. Or the dynamics is how those members interact over time. So understanding community structure and dynamics allow us to minimize impact on ecosystem and manage ecological communities uh, we benefit from. Um, to uh, study communities, uh, it's very important to understand the concept of biodiversity. Uh, so biodiversity is um, used uh, to uh, estimate if if this community is healthy, uh, is it has a good chance to, um, you know, stay in equilibrium for a long time, or it might be a subject of uh, extinction, or it can be endangered, right? We always want to keep biodiversity high. Uh, but how to measure biodiversity? So biodiversity can be measured by species richness and relative species abundance. Well, species richness is really uh, kind of like easy concept. You just you know, count how many species live in a particular habitat, right? So let's say here's community one, community two, and we have one, two, three, four, four different species living in each of these communities. So these communities have the same species richness. But so that's not enough to um, measure biodiversity. We also need relative species abundance. And this is the number of individuals in the species relative to the total number of individuals. So like percentage. So if you look at this community, you have four different species and each species have about 25% um, uh, from the total number, right? In this community, however, we have, well, 6% um, of one species, 12, 70, and 12% and of, oh, I'm sorry, 70, 12, 70, and 12, right? So obviously the relative abundance is different. So now the question is, which community has the higher biodiversity? And that would be community one because um, that's not good for community to have, let's say, species abandoned 
it might be just one single tree. Yeah, look, that's just one single tree. So if some disaster happens over here and this tree dies, just one tree, we immediately go through to uh, species richness will be only three species. Here, you know, even if this tree dies, we still have, you know, three more that have chances to survive. So that's more stable community, community number one, it's a healthier community and higher biodiversity. Uh, for communities also, it's important to understand how different, um, different organisms benefit those communities. So we have foundation species. Foundation species considered to be base or bedrock community. And they have greatest influence on its overall structure. Um, so foundation species actually determine what type of community uh, we will have in this particular uh, habitat. Um, foundation species are often primary producers. So that means they are phototrophic organisms, right? They uh, use sun energy and carbon dioxide and water to produce um, complex organic structures such as glucose, and they typically very abandoned. For example, kelp. Kelp, it's a species of brown algae, is a foundation species that forms the basis of the kelp forest of the coast of California. So in California, foundation species are those brown algae in a um, ocean coast. Another important species in the communities are keystone species. And they also play a major role in determining community structure. But they usually in a low abundance. Uh, and usually those are large animals and predators or herbivores, right? So let's go over here. So at foundation species, we usually have lots of them, right? Abandoned number of them and they're usually producers. Keystone species, we don't have that many of them, they're actually low in abundance and they usually what consumers and not just consumers, they are large predators and herbivores. But when removed, they have significant impact on the community as a whole and they affect well-being of all other species. Right, so here example, grizzlies, bisons, alligators, right, even sea stars. Right, so that's a keystone species. Community dynamics. So community dynamics are the changes in a community um, uh, over time. And usually uh, those changes follow some environmental disturbance. So imagine that community in equilibrium because community used to stay in equilibrium and then some disturbance, some disaster happens, like what? Volcanoes, earthquake, storm, fire, or even climate change, right? So when this disturbance happen, we expect uh, then, um, you know, change in a um, species and the number of species and their relationship to each other, right? So then we will have um, changes follow this disturbance. If community are not changing, we, uh, they are said to be at equilibrium. And after this disturbance, community may or may not return to this equilibrium state. So this, um, you know, changes in communities after disturbance is called succession, right? So succession described sequential appearance and disappearance of species in a community over time after severe disturbance. And we have primary and secondary succession. So here's an example of primary succession. Primary succession begins uh, on a virtually lifeless area with no soil. That's very important, no soil. So we have, let's say, bare rock. So how would we have bare uh, rock? We can have it after lava flows or glacier retrievers. So is there a glacier or some volcanic eruption? But what happened, there is no soil, right? 
And we start with the bare rock, and then we have this primary succession that will include first appearance of pioneer species. And those are like lichens. Lichens are, um, it, it's a symbiotic relationship between fungus and algae, or fungus and um, cyanobacteria, but they can live pretty much on a bare rock. And when they live on a bare rock, they use photosynthesis um, to, um, to survive, right? They might use some minerals from this bare rock, right? But um, then when they die, right, they have, we have this organic now substances, organic matter that other organisms can use. So after lichens, we will have small annual plants. Uh, then we will have grasses, perennials. Then we have some shrubs and shade intolerant trees, such as pine trees. And then you see the quality of the soil uh, increasing, right, over time. So it's, it became more, um, it became rich in the minerals, it retained water, right? It has all this, uh, you know, organic um, decaying stuff as well. Right? So you see now which species are changing over time. And then we get to the shade tolerant trees, such as oak, and that's what called climax community. So the climax community are determined by climate. Uh, so not only uh, we, um, we see how one species um, appears and some disappears, we also see that quality of soil increasing and interaction between organisms became more and more complex. So we have now animals migrating in this area, prey and predators, right? So we not only increasing the number of species, we increasing the quality of soil, we make um, interaction more complex and we increasing biodiversity and finally reaching climax community, right? Stay with bare rock and now we have community of organisms and it's take hundreds of years. Another uh, type of succession is secondary succession. Secondary succession occurs uh, when a disturbance destroyed community but left the soil intact. An example would be flood or fire. And also we will have, um, we will see how some species appear, some disappears, how they replace each other, how interaction became more complex. Um, so here, let's look at this diagram now. So this is our secondary succession. We do have fire and fire destroys the community, but nothing happened with the soil, right? Soil is still intact. Uh, we also see this pioneer species uh, and it start with annual plants, then grasses, perennial, and the quality of soil improves. Deeper soil, more water, more nutrients, and larger plants can grow. And this will lead to a greater biodiversity and it's bring, um, in, and this increase the consumer biodiversity as well. We see more complex food webs, more complex interactions between population, right? But um, here we have annual grasses, shrubs, and again, um, some um, trees like, like pine trees, young oak trees, and then we have our climax community. So it's a mature, um, community that is determined by the climate. Um, so success, succession in a particular area will always result in the same type of stable community, right? Population will form ecological niches if not disturbed by external forces. And climate determine what type of community will be in that particular area. Is it gonna be a desert, grassland, or forest? So here we have um, comparance. Um, we can compare primary and secondary succession, and we can see how this starts with the bare rock, and this starts with soil, and this one takes um, hundreds and thousands of years, like 1,000. This takes shorter time, like 100 years. Let's see. Okay. And that's our last slide. So each the um, successive community prepares the way for the next. 
uh, colonies may hold on to their space and inhibit growth of other plants until the colonies die or are damaged. Different types of plant can colonize same area at same time, depends on which seeds get there first, time uh, and time of maturation. And once the plants colonize, other organisms can return, birds, insects, and small mammals. Right, so, um, so that, that's it for this chapter. Um, um, thank you for watching, and I hope it was helpful.